On our recent missionary trip to East Africa, first Nairobi, Kenya, then Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Driving through the downtown streets of Addis Ababa, I pulled out my camera and began recording. As you can see, it was like driving through any other city on this planet. A city of five million people, commercially strong, stable, vital. Nairobi, a city of well over four million people. Clearly, you can see there's not much difference between these two cities and the cities of London, Tokyo, Shanghai, Buenos Aires, Toronto, Kingston, Manila, Las Vegas, Boston, Moscow, etc., and on and on. A city is a city is a city is a city. These are the result of humanity's first homicidal maniac, Cain, who built the first city on earth. God's plan for the human race was rural living. Thus, he placed his first school home students in a garden that he himself planted. Regarding the current global crisis, the turmoil in these cities worldwide will soon reach a level of biblical proportions. But, brother, sister, God has a solution in place. But as the days of Noah were, says the Bible, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be, Matthew 24, 37. God told Noah in no uncertain terms, because of the prevailing iniquity at that time, I need you to build an ark, an ark of safety, an ark of refuge. If the same sins that existed in Noah's time exist in our world today, surely the solution must be the same today as it was then. God is not asking you and I to build a boat, luxury liner, or canoe, but he's asking us, brother, sister, to build another type of ark. He's asking us to build a country outpost center. This is the route to this brother's house. And as you can see, we are in the mountains. The scenery is beautiful. It is actually spectacular. Up in the mountains, pine trees everywhere. And I'm following this brother. This humble little rental car up the trail, up the winding mountain road. Glory to God. Now, this is some serious country living here, and I love it. I absolutely love it. I passed a sign about a mile back. The sign actually said Primitive Road no more signs beyond this point let me repeat that the sign said primitive road no more signs beyond this point and i would i would definitely consider this to be a primitive road but this is god's plan brothers and sisters not depending on the system not depending on support earthly support depending on god Country Outpost Center is God's plan to finish this work. It is going to be, it should be, the Country Outpost Center established away from the city where we can actually work the city without living in it. It is a storehouse or should be a storehouse for preaching, teaching, healing, and publishing all of them in the same place. One manuscript released, page 228, paragraph two. Sister White says, God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world 
is to prepare people to stand true to him during the investigative judgment. She goes on to say, this is the purpose in which we establish and maintain our publishing houses, our schools, our sanitariums, hygienic restaurants, treatment rooms, food factories. Then she said, this is our purpose in carrying forward every line of work in the cause. So all of those six bullet points, all of those six components contained in one manuscript release, page 228, paragraph two, we should have on some level, to some degree, contained within the walls or within the boundary lines of our outpost centers. The outpost center is a place where we should have the Eden School blueprint set up where nature is actually the schoolroom. Our Lord and Father and Savior is the instructor and we and or our children are the students, just like our dear first parents, Adam and Eve, are the students, or were the students in the beginning. Amen. We are entering the driveway now of our dear brother's property. And we are going to park and continue inside. Amen. God be with us. Greetings, brothers and sisters of the Remnant Church. My name is Brother Elvin Bridges of Living Man of Ministries, and we are here in the great northwest portion of the United States in the great state of Washington, eastern Washington to be exact. And we're here for another edition of a Country Living series here. We're entitling, of course, this one, Out of the Cities, the Country Outpost Center. And we're going to see exactly why God refers to it as his private school. Amen. I'm here with a wonderful family today, the Carney family, and we're going to be focusing today more on the business aspect of country living, how to make a country living, a business ministry, what we like to refer to as a business tree. So I have the priest of the home here with me now, Brother Scott Carney. Brother. Hey, brother. I appreciate you welcome, welcoming me into your home here in, in uh, Eastern West Washington. Praise Amen. God. Praise God. I'd like to first of all start off by talking about a little bit about your, your background and your testimony and how you came to be into the truth, how the Lord led you into the truth. Sure. Yeah, I mean, my testimony really starts in 1967 with a young woman who had a big decision to make. Okay. And that decision was to um, not have a child or give a child up for adoption. And praise God, mm. um, that child was me and uh, my birth mother uh, opted to give me up for adoption to okay. a, a wonderful family, okay. uh, Jerry and Lucille Carney okay. uh, in uh, Bellevue, Washington. Praise the Lord. So, um, now, is that over on the, is that on the western side? Of the state or on this side? That's on the western side, but classified as the east side of Seattle. Okay. Or the east side. Okay, yeah. I understand. Praise God. So you grew up in that town? I did. I grew up, grew up in Bellevue. Okay. Yeah. And was there any religion in the home, per se, as far as any orthodox religious practices taking place in the home at all at that time? Sure, yeah. For about the first eight years of my life, we grew up in the Episcopalian church. Okay. Um, and... Um, you know, being young, I wasn't too familiar with a lot of the doctrines, of course, but yes, uh, um, uh, that evolved into when I was about age nine, moving into the non non-denominational church, going to a okay. Sunday church. Okay. Um, okay. So. so it was pretty much church every Sunday for the most part. It was that I could remember. It was pretty much church every Sunday. Okay. That's right. Amen. Okay. So tell us now, and again, we're going to make our way into the outpost section or aspect of this this uh, segment this evening where we're going to discuss how we got or how Brother Scott got to where he is now, which is in the country in eastern Tennessee. We're just going to follow a path of his past, his present, and of course God's glorious future for his family and all present truth believers. Amen. So at what point would you say the door was open when the light came on as far as Adventism was concerned? Sure, that was uh, actually so several, <laughs> several years later. Okay. Um, you know, I had grown up in, in my home, and I was uh, very much into a sports uh, okay. background. Athlete. Uh, so athlete, yes. Okay. Uh, you know, baseball, football, basketball. So my, my burning desire as a young person was to be a professional baseball player. Really? Um, so that's what drove me, um, you know, through my early years, early teens. Yes, sir. Um, and then I excelled into the uh, collegiate level. Okay. As I grew up, I had an opportunity to go play baseball at a um, university called Washington State University. Okay, okay. Um, so 
Um, I got a partial scholarship to play baseball there. Okay. Um, so my dream was uh, continuing uh, to unfold uh, before me there. Mm -hmm. um, and I did not attend a church because I got involved in the worldly, uh, yes. you know, thoughts and, and activities of college. Sure. You know, the parties and, sure, the, sure. and the drinking and the, yes. and the having fun. So I lost sight of really my Christianity I understand. And, and my moral uh, background. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. So you now you're in your early 20s and you're making right. your way through young adulthood. At what point would you say it was a turning point or at what point, what stage in your life were you first exposed to Adventism? Yeah, you know, when I had uh, finally graduated, my, my career had uh, ended in uh, uh, during those early, in my early 20s. Mm. Uh, and a lot of it was for, um, uh, as you get up in the um, ranks of athletics, it becomes more political. Yes, and, and you start to realize what people and what people do to get to the position mm. or the level they want. Mm. And for me, I'm just uh, a pretty simple person wanting to do the best that I can. And when yes. I saw that, it discouraged me greatly. Sure. And, it, and I, it really gave, it really destroyed my love for the game. I understand. Um, although God was using that as a blessing, that destruction, He was going to turn that in later years and that competitiveness mm -hmm. uh, into where we are today. Amen. And when I graduated, I had a few odds and ends, uh, basically a telecommunication sales job. I got into the food business, working for a food broker, representing you know, companies like Nestle and Ocean Spray okay. and Quaker, uh, okay. selling products to stores um, on the east side and up north. And, okay. um, and um, that opportunity brought me to Bellingham, Washington which okay. was about an hour and a half north of where I was at living at the time. Okay. Um, and during the, it was the, at that time that I received the flyer in the mail, a prophecy brochure. Really? And um, I had, through the early years after college and these jobs, I'd been watching 700 Club and Benny Hinn and these people yes. saying, the Antichrist is Mikhail Gorbachev, or it's this person. Yes. And watching all these different channels, it really was confusing because this person is saying, Sure. This is the Antichrist. No, the Antichrist is going to come up in Israel at this time. Right. Very confusing for me. And I, <laughs> mm -hmm. I thought, it's got to be simpler than that. Yes, sir. It's yes, got to be simpler than that. And, and so my heart was open to truth at that point. And so again, when I received the flyer, mm -hmm. um, I saw the graphics and what is the mark of the beast, mm. state of the dead, mm. um, you know, uh, hellfire, what happens when, when the soul dies. Okay. And so for me, those topics were of, of, of great interest. Caught your attention. Didn't they it? caught my attention. So this is somebody doing a, a revelation in Daniel seminar, so to speak. Right. Or prophecy seminar. Right. It in was, your area. Yeah, it was in okay. my area. And it was Leo Screven. Okay. Uh, the okay. late Leo Screven. He yes. passed away, I think, uh, four, about four years ago. Yes, but, sir. Um, so I had the brochure, and, and typically, you know, for these campaigns, they'll send these out six weeks to yes. eight weeks uh, earlier. Yes, sir. And, and they attract people through that. And, and so I had put this brochure in my drawer hmm. um, during that time, and periodic, periodically I would open it up to get a phone number or hmm. somebody's address, and I would see it, and I would look at it and say, okay, that thing's coming up in... Okay. In three to four weeks. So was your initial reaction, this looks great, I'm very interested in this, I'm going. Was that your initial reaction when you first saw the, the flyer? Yeah, I didn't really necessarily commit that I was going, but I was interested and I thought this is probably something I should go to. Mm. So I really hadn't committed myself, but I said, um, you know, it's a, it's a ways down the road, I should be able to go. Okay. Um, but we'll see when it yes, comes. Sir. And yes, um, so as I moved closer to the event, um, uh, one afternoon, I had a, a pretty long day, and I had looked, cooked myself up some dinner, and I, I looked in the drawer, and I, I looked at it, and I said, well, when is that summer? It's got to be coming up, and mm -hmm. sure enough, it was that <clears throat> night. Really? Um, and that night happened to be the national championship basketball game with UCLA and Arkansas. And, <laughs> I, had, Interesting. and I was very tired, but I had looked, so for whatever reason, opened that, that drawer up and saw that brochure. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, that's tonight. And my thought was, but the game's on, and I'm yeah. tired. And what year was this? And this was in uh, 1995. Okay, so you were torn. You were a little torn regarding the seminar and the game. So I was torn, yeah. It had been a long day. Um, the game was on, yeah. and, um, but the seminar. But a voice told me, Scott, just go to one night. Mm. It just said, go to one night. Mm -hmm. And I said, praise God. 
And I said, but I'm tired. Uh, I don't want to go to one. <laughs> this is, and it said, Scott, go to one night. And I said, I don't even know where this place is. Mm. And the voice said, the directions are on back of the brochure. Follow the directions mm. and go to one night. Mm. And so I said, fine, I'll go to one night. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Turned the TV off and cleaned up and, and went to the seminar. Okay. So you went to the first night. What was the topic of the first night? Do you remember? Yeah, the first night was on um, stats, basically stats on the crime rate in the United States, the drug use, what's happening to our youth. Okay. And the... Um, uh, you know, the, basically the destruction of the, of the family and what's right. happening so uh, a, in the world. So it yes. was kind of a general... Like a foundation, a moral foundation as far as where morality was going, going or heading. Right, right, yeah, right. I understand that. And, uh, but then they, at the end of it, um, he said, but tomorrow night's topic mm. is going to be on... I can't recall the topic, but mm. I said, well, that, now that's one of the topics that I had seen before that I'm very interested okay. in. Okay. And so I said, I'll come back to one more yes, night. Yes, sir. You see how important it is, brothers and sisters, we, we, we tend to underestimate the power of these series and these revelation you know, programs and these seminars and just the fact that a person can see and even the, the way the flyer is designed speaks volumes because it caught your attention. The, 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 the graphic design and the wording catches your attention. These that's things right. are very important and that's why we have to pray that God helps in anything that has to do with publishing in this work. It's extremely important because hearts can be touched by it. So the second night, they teased you about what that would be, and then you attended? Yeah, okay. yeah. The, the, I came back the second night, and it was, for me, spectacular. Now, I wanted to make sure um, that the Bible they gave me, that was I was going to use it. So I was going back, because I didn't know. I had heard nothing about Seventh-day Adventism. So yes. I wanted to know, was he going from the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, Old... Right. So I was highlighting the whole time that, se that second night. Okay. And everything that he said was from the Bible. And so I said, wow, this is fantastic. Praise the Lord. And then he mentioned again at the end of the second night what the third night's going to be. Right. So to make a long story short, um, he had a, I believe it was a 24-night seminar. Mm. And um, I attended all 24 nights. Praise God. And, um, wow. And decided that uh, I, know I was going to join the, uh, the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Okay. Um, it was interesting on the topic of the mark of the beast, mm -hmm. though, and then Sabbath, because I recall in the church when he went over the Sabbath issue mm -hmm. that I heard a voice say, But Scott, none of your family members go to church on Sabbath, mm -hmm. none of your friends go to church on Saturday. Mm -hmm. This is ridiculous. You cannot do this. I'm in a church mm -hmm. listening to the truth. And I'm hearing this voice yeah. tell me, don't do this. Isn't that something? And I'm like, I've just gone through it. I've been highlighting for a week, right. for the several, last several weeks, all right. through this series. Yes. And it's true. You reasoned it out. There was no doubt it was the unadulterated truth of God. But some voice is telling you it isn't. It isn't. And you can't do it. It's going to be embarrassing. You can't, your mm. family doesn't do it. Mm. You know, your family, they're going to think you're a fanatic. You're yeah. going to be a crazy person. The devil's a liar, brother. <laughs> and, uh, so, so you baptized at this point. Did you baptize at the end of this, this uh, series? I did, yeah. We got baptized at the end of the series. Okay, that's praise correct. God. Yeah. So a couple of questions for you, brother. And that's a wonderful testimony, praise God. It's a couple of questions. At what point after you baptized and you joined the church that you joined, how long after that did you hear about health? Do you recall? Um... Well, I, w I was baptized in 1995. Okay. I didn't start hearing about health reform or health for 10 years, probably 10 years. Okay. I mean, it was, it was a long time. A little, little, a little yeah. gap in there, huh? Yeah, it was okay. a big gap. So. Okay, okay. Second question, and that's just for foundational purposes. Second question, how long after you baptized did you first hearing, start hearing any information regarding the country living message and leaving the city? Yeah, that was probably... Probably about 12 to 13 years. Okay. Um, because, you know, when I was baptized, I was on fire. You know, I was telling mm -hmm. a lot of people, family members, and family members were saying, I understand this, but going to church on Saturday or this Sabbath you're talking about is just not, mm. it's not for us. Right. Um, you know, and um, so when I continued on, I actually, in my job, I moved from the food broker position to mm -hmm. a direct sales job with Kraft Foods. Okay. 
And that brought me back down into the east side area, just east of Seattle. Okay. Um, so I attended a church that was a um, local church on the east side. Okay. And um, it was difficult because there were no, there were either old people, what you call gray hairs, or yes, the children. So, uh, I, so I'm in the middle of this right. and um, nobody my age in the church. Mm. So my, my fire and my desire started to wane over the years, you okay. know, and I, and I began to attend church maybe two times a month. Okay. Um, okay. And never, you may bring, bring up the point about health reform, nobody ever talked about this health reform. I mean, okay. other than caffeine and smoking and sure. drinking, these the types of things, the yeah. obvious things. Sure, sure. That's interesting. Um, now, I, I want to make a mental note regarding Brother Scott's uh, mentioning his, his uh, employment and his, his livelihood as far as being in the food industry is concerned. And his experience with that, that's going to play a role in what he's doing now later on in his present truth experience. We're going to get into that a little bit later. So you're in the smaller home and you're looking now for country property in Washington. Now, at this point, you're still on the west side of the state, correct? Still on the west side okay. of the state. That's so correct. what led you? Was it the fact that she was from Spokane? Did that lead you to come over to this side of the state? Well, I'd looked in Washington, Oregon. I was looking in Tennessee, some areas, because we were All at right. that point, we were on a fixed budget. We knew how okay. much equity we had in our home. Mm -hmm. And in Western Washington, a lot of places in Oregon, it was very expensive for even five acres. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a um, fellow church member said, you gotta look where, where we are over in Northeastern Washington. Mm. So I started to look and that's when I found this home. Okay. Um, Praise and, God. Um, the things are changing. I, I was mentioning to uh, the brother this morning, that um, we got our place in 2015 in Tennessee, and the price per acre has doubled since then. Just for a little over four years, it's doubled. So things are changing. So you come across this place, and we're gonna actually take a little walk, a tour around this property in a few minutes. So you find this place. Now just out of curiosity, and for our dear saints, where did you find it? Was it on Craigslist? Was it on Realtor.com? Was it on another? real estate website? Did you just drive around the area and came across it? How did you find it? Yeah, it was a little interesting because I was just looking on the MLS, you know, Remax, okay. uh, Windermere. And I hadn't looked at the, uh, I believe it was a John L. Scott uh, uh, listing page. Okay, okay. And um, and I come across it and I'm like, why didn't I come across it on the other MLM on mm. Remax and Windermere? Mm. And so it popped up on John L. Scott, uh, off-grid 2009 built home, 780 square feet. Okay, off-grid. Yeah, and I was All thinking, right. wow, it's it's pretty green over there. It's like like Western Washington. So, yeah. um, I thought I need to take a look at this place. So I showed Leslie, and she goes, Yeah, go ahead and take a look at it. And Dire so, Ages, page one twenty one, paragraph three. Sister White says, "In the last great conflict and the controversy with Satan, those who remain loyal or who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off." So when we read that quote, we realize that we have to really simplify. And we have to get to a point where we're not dependent on the amenities and the different, you know, luxuries or whatever. It, it's really important to really break down to the lowest component the, the idea of just survival, basically. Because mm -hmm. at some point, that's all we're going to have is us and God. So all the electric, you know, the electrical items and the the, uh, the fancy machines and the, the the different products. We have to really get to a point where we're we're going to really literally be pretty much back to washing our clothes on the washboard, you know. Mm -hmm. It's gonna to get to that point. And not only the power and electricity and these things, but earthly support, meaning even your family, are gonna to get to a point where they're gonna cut you off too. All earthly support. So right. the only support will be, based on that, that statement, heavenly support. That's all we'll have to depend on. So we have to take this, I think, much more serious than we do. So this is, what year is this now? Uh, it's just, this, yeah, this was 2011, the okay. fall of 2011 when we purchased the home. Okay, okay. So how long after you purchased it did you actually move in? Uh, we moved in on June 5th, 2012, about six okay. months later, six so to seven months later. You recall the exact date? Yeah, it's on our, we have a outpost sign, Wolf Mountain Outpost, 6512. Amen, Amen 6512. Like so that. it's a reminder of the, um, really what I call is the, um, uh, meeting the experience moved to the outpost for yes, us. Yes, that's right. You know, that's because right. we had moved, to me it's like we had, on a much smaller level, you know, here Moses is in the courts of Egypt with all the luxuries of Egypt and God mm -hmm. sends him 40 years, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And he becomes the most humble man. That's right. In the world. And, and to me that was, 
this is what our experience was going to be on a much Absolutely. smaller. Absolutely. We're not taking two million people out of out of Egypt or to the Promised Land or more. Or more. Yeah. Um, yeah. But this for us um, was going to get us out of our comfort zone. That's right. And um, it was going to be a character uh, yeah. transformation situation. And it's necessary for God to do that. We need to be in a situation where He can He can actually use us, but He can't use us if self is, is in the way. And right. Sister White actually brings out the fact that while Moses was in the in in the uh, the hills of uh, of Midian for forty years, he was doing his pastoral work. She actually uses that term pastoral work, which I think is pretty amazing. So he was breaking Moses down, but at the same time he was building up, but building him up for his own kingdom and not the Egyptian kingdom. Right. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful lesson. Okay, so now you move in, and you call, it, it is like Wolf, Wolf, Wolf Mountain, Mountain Outpost. Outpost. I, I like that name because we have wolves, so we have cougars, and we have bears. And I thought, mm. you know, Wolf Mountain Outpost sounds. Yeah. Now I know some of the things I'm good. hearing this. They're saying, wait a minute. I'm going to move to, to the country and I might have to contend with wolves and cougars and bears and mooses and, but brother, sister, if we're faithful, God will protect us. When the children of Israel were in the wilderness, the Lord held back the poisonous snakes, the adders, all that stuff was held back at a great distance. He protected his people. But as soon as he began to rebel, to rebel he had to say, he pulled back and let him cut him loose, let him loose. So if we're right. obedient, if we're faithful, if we're loyal, if we're consecrated, God will protect his people. And not when you just get to the country, but we're talking about all the way through beyond the Sunday law, all the way to when Michael stands up in that most holy place. Amen. So this, this is a long term commitment, not just short term. So <clears throat> now you're in the country now after June 5th in 2012. So now what's your work situation at this point? Yeah, the work situation is that my wife had requested that I had a job before we moved. Um, so I had got a position at Providence, the local hospital, as a, as a front desk uh, entry person. I would, people right. would come in for MRI. I would, I would you know, get them set in, and then I would sure, sure. lead them down the hall to their uh, okay. appropriate ap appointment. Okay. Um, so that's what I was doing for the first three months. And actually, um, I was doing that from April 2012 till June 5th when all of us... <laughs> She had, my daughter and wife actually came to the uh, location here. Okay, okay, so they moved um, in a little later than you did. Yeah, they moved a little okay. bit later than I did. Sure. And so. it was a little interesting because when I came out here by myself, um, you know, being from the city and the suburbs, mm -hmm. it's quiet out here. Mm -hmm. And a couple of nights when I unloaded a lot of the, our items into the home, yes, you get a little nervous because you're not yes. used to the... Too quiet, huh? It's too quiet. You're yes. wondering what's out there in the dark, <laughs> yes, you know? And even yes, the sir. days after, I think, okay, I gotta get started on here. I need to chop this wood up. I gotta start landscaping this, because I had a vision of this, of this outpost. Mm -hmm. This was gonna be uh, a, little, a little piece of heaven on earth right yes, here, sir. is what we're yes, gonna sir. transform Praise it into. Lord, so, um, so when I'm out there weeding, this is the next day, mm -hmm. uh, daylight. Again, it's so quiet. I yes, start sir. to get nervous. I'm feeling like there's a wild beast watching me. Yes. <laughs> Um, <laughs> where where is it? And I'm like, Lord, I'm not used to this area. I'm a city suburb guy. Yes, yes. You know, give me the confidence and the peace that a, a cougar or a bear is not going to kill me. Yes. Out here, I mean, because that's that was a real feeling. Sure. Out here, absolutely. Um, we're on 20 acres. This is woods. Yeah. Um, As humans, we have a tendency to think the worst, don't we? Yeah. So it's human nature. So no money is coming in. We had done. Uh, began this edition, finished this edition off, which did cost us, you know, some money to do this work mm -hmm, here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, but then an opportunity came about at the um, the health food store, mm -hmm. which was across from the local church. And, and um, okay. And so the position was nine dollars and forty one cents an hour, mm -hmm. uh, minimum wage of Washington State. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was like, so you you are <sighs> telling me, brother Scott? And again, this is for the the the, the benefit of those who are considering leaving the city and things you have to contend with and deal with. This is reality. So the Lord is really kind of breaking you down a little bit, humbling you. Right. Because you were coming from a place where your combined income at home was, was 200K. That's now right. you're making minimum wage. And I think you even went a step further. You mentioned something to me a couple of months ago about you got a job as a manager somewhere else, which was even maybe a lower, lesser situation as far as employment is concerned. 
but please continue about this job. Yeah, so I'm working and I decided to take the position. My wife says, we have yes. no other money coming in. Yes. And we're losing we money. Yeah. We're, we're getting down. You're in the red. Yeah, we're, we are. We're, we're losing money, losing money fast. Yes, and, sir. And so I took the opportunity and um, uh, learning more about health reform and, and I, um, I instituted a vegan cafe. Okay. Um, so Leslie had, had several recipes that we had used. And, Amen. And so we wanted to reach the community through um, you know, a health reforming um, cafe mm -hmm. to provide, um, provide good food and sure hygienic restaurant. And, yeah, basically a hygienic restaurant, mm -hmm. and, and that went well. I mean, we were we were doing quite well, but the funds to buy the products for the for the cafe and to buy the products for the other health food products uh, in the store, we just didn't have the money for it. Okay. And so the store ended up uh, uh, headed downward, and I knew it was going to be going under at some point. All right. Okay. So that's when um, you had mentioned the previous employment. That's when I had to look for other opportunities. And it's interesting, you go from, here I am a pharmaceutical sales rep, we were making all of this money. I'm thinking, wow, this is, this is getting bad. Mm. You know, now I've, I can't work here because the store is gonna close. Now mm. where do I go? Mm. So I had applied in Spokane for different jobs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but based on where we were living, um, the positions or the sales representative opportunities were not available mm. because I was too far out of the Spokane right. County area Understood. Uh, to make sense for a, a company to hire me. Sure, sure. And so, um, so as all the doors shut, I said, well, maybe I'll work in the produce department of Walmart. It's, it's, it's a healthy department. Mm. And so they had an opening and I, I went and applied and I, I got that job. Okay. And, um, and so in that process, I'm thinking, and this is where it gets difficult because she says, don't consider a privation to move out to the country. That's you right. may have to give up your profession and try something new. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, so you may be a physician in a city, a young physician, you get the call to move out if you're earlier, earlier than retirement age. Yes. You may not be able to be a physician mm -hmm. or you mm -hmm. may not be, uh, be able to be a, uh, a certain software designer or something. You may That's have right. to do something else. So. That's right. So I, I, I remember that quote, mm -hmm. uh, but still my, my character isn't developed and it's progressing. Yes. And, and, yes. and I start thinking to myself and my pride starts to come up and, and yes, sir. I'm thinking Walmart, yeah. <laughs> Walmart, you're, right. this is going to be embarrassing. What are people going to think? What's your family mm -hmm. going to think? Mm -hmm. And the people at church are going to see you in Walmart. Mm -hmm. You're just headed downward. It's just. And so, I, and then a you know a voice says, Scott, you're on a journey. Do you yeah. want do you want to stay on this road? Yes, sir. And uh, and I was like, yeah. I. And then a, this voice kind of said, do this and be a good example, and work hard here. Amen. And I'm like, man, in a Walmart. Mm. But I didn't have any options, and, and so I had to find something. So That's yeah, right. the Walmart position. I was there for about a year and a half. Okay. Okay. Um, great, great mission field, by the way, Walmart. Great mission field. Great opportunity right. to witness. So, uh, as I transitioned from the health food store to Walmart, mm -hmm. I had um, um, started less than I because we knew we needed to supplement our income, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so we had decided to make a frozen, what we would call mm -hmm. caribou truffles. Okay. And so. Um, now, question for you. I want to pause right there. Right. So, wh where did you get? Where did this idea first come from? For the carob truffles, yeah, the carob truffles uh, or caribou truffles came uh, basically an idea to supplement our income at the health food store. Okay, uh, because nine dollars and forty-one cents wasn't working, so I felt I need to develop a product to sell throughout the country. Okay, and one of the organizations or distributors that I was working with at the store to bring in products into the store was Azure Standard. Ah, and okay, so that's so, how the everything kind of first opened up for you. Right. Okay, right. so that was the first exposure to the carob to caribou through Azure Standard. Okay, I see now, okay. Yeah. So this is now the genesis, as it were, of you and your family first getting into the thought or the idea of generating your own income. Okay, Yeah. so please continue. Yeah, so, so in the process of deciding of uh, making these uh, caribou balls, caribou truffles, I was thinking, boy, chocolate truffles sell a lot of them. Mm. But I knew we were in the process of trying to give up chocolate you know, as a family because of the, 
you know, there's trace amounts of caffeine in some That's chocolates. Right. There's That's theobromine, right. which is the stimulant component, which is the addictive component of chocolate Coffee. that gets you to come chocolate. back and back and back. That's right. Not, the to caf- not to mention rat feces also. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, you know, the caffeine gives you that increased energy like coffee or, yes, or caffeine in coffee or tea. Yes, sir. Um, but uh, the process of giving up chocolate, so my daughter, Elise, says, uh, Daddy, she goes, why are we going to make chocolate balls and sell them for money if we're trying to give up chocolate? Mm-hmm. And I immediately think, out of the mouth of babes. <laughs> Interesting <laughs> you know? question. And, and I already knew that, but I'm thinking, we're in a, we're in a somewhat desperate situation here. Yeah. To me, it's desperate. Because we're going from a suburb living mm-hmm. to a country living where basically everything's falling apart and money yeah. is gone. You know, this is important, brother. I want to make sure that our viewers really understand this is reality. And a lot of families that make the transition, initially, it's, it, it can be very difficult. My family and I went through something very similar also with both our country moves. Uh, but God is faithful and he's going to not allow us to fall, to fail. But we have to go through some things. He has to purify and purge us. He has to do that in order to use us the way he wants to use us. So you're in a rough spot at this point. You're now developing the home business for the first time and, and uh, continue from that point. Yeah, so we, we end up deciding based on um, you know, our own experience and from the elders that that's not a good choice to sell the chocolate. So then I began mm-hmm. to search of vegan chocolate. Okay. Uh, or not vegan, excuse me, vegan yes. carob. Thank you, my brother. Um, Thank you, my brother. And, um, and that was difficult because we couldn't find a vegan carob chip to actually coat our, our caribou truffles. Okay. And uh, But during that time, I had found the Australian carob company. Okay. And that's who I initially thought these vegan chips, perfect. We can coat these with our truffles, sell these to Azure Standard. We'll get these across the entire United States. Yes. Um, and that will help us sustain ourselves out here. And, okay. Just for the viewers, uh, brother uh, Scott, just briefly, can you just give us a quick little brief overview of Azure Standard, who they are and what they do? Right, yeah, Azure Standard is the, um, is the uh, largest organic bulk distributor yes. in the United States. Amen. And so they have trucks that deliver to um, different spots throughout the country. The only area with the exception is the Northeast area. Right, and we're familiar so, with them, and we as a family utilize them and buy products from them pretty much every month, and they come through our area uh, monthly, and not only right. near right near us, but if we happen to be busy or away from home or somewhere else in Tennessee, they actually drop off in several other points in Tennessee on the way down to Georgia and further. So they're very they're, they're a great company. I'm not trying to promote them or anything, but they're yeah. really a great company, especially for those who are health reformers. They're they're very yeah. very advantageous. Yes. And to backtrack just a little bit, as I found the Australian Care, Care Company, this is the transition from the health food store to to Walmart. Okay, right. Um, and what had happened is Michael had sent me the products from Australia here to the house. Okay. And I got the products and we had tested them in our, our, in our caribou truffles mm-hmm. and it tasted fantastic. The caribou was a lot better, a lot sweeter than the, what we would call the old generation carob. Right. Uh, which is grown for the seed, not the pod. Okay. Um, so we were thinking, this is a great product. Amen. You know, we're, we're, we're set with this. Amen. And um, uh, did you allow or did you, I don't mean to cut you off brother. Sure. But did you let other people taste it to get an idea that it wasn't just your family that liked it, that others may like it as well? Yeah, you know, we did. We brought, brought them to church. We brought them yes. to our neighbors and had our daughter uh, try them because sometimes kids uh, yeah. like something that adults That's don't. That's very and so, true. Yeah. So we did. We, uh, we had a taste uh, panel of people to try the, okay. try the flavors. And we had five flavors. <clears> but, um, but in the meantime... The, uh, the carob powder that we were getting from Australia, from Michael, mm-hmm. um, he was su- suggesting to us that he already had somebody in Los Angeles to distribute the products. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> so when we had the products here, I'm thinking, 
what a disappointment, Lord, that this came so late. Now he's got a distributor in Los Angeles. Mm. And I, Leslie and I could have been the distributor, distributor for this line of products, but he's already got somebody. Let me ask you this so, though, just, just, to, just out of curiosity, you mentioned LA now. What, what would a distributor in LA, how would that affect you being a distributor in Washington? Is it too, because it's all West Coast or is it because it's the Western half of this, the, the nation or? Well, there... he, he had preliminary set up a distributor somewhere in Los Angeles where a guy was gonna warehouse the products and then do, okay. what, do what we're doing currently out to, I see. to the United States. So, so, that, so that was too close or he just needed only one? He just wanted only one, okay. but then as, as we progress in our discussions, uh, he emailed me one day and said, I'd like you to be the U.S. agent, not the person in Los Angeles. Amen. Amen. And I was surprised because I thought he had somebody lined up mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. So then we then became the U.S. agent for his products, the powders, the kibble, the syrup, in right. addition to our caribou truffles that we were launching right. as a self-supporting business. So I see. I see. Okay. So at this point now, this is what year is this now? 2000? This is 2015. 2015. Now. So now we're in more recent history. Right. Okay. So at this point... You are the only U.S. distributor of that product. That's correct. Time. Okay. Now, are you still the only U.S. distributor now? We are. Yeah, we we have an agreement that we uh, are the only agent in the United States and Canada. Okay. Okay. Praise God. So yeah. So, this is your ministry business or your business tree, basically. Uh, you're not trying to be a millionaire, obviously. Uh, this is not going to make you a millionaire, but it's working things out for you and your family. Is that correct? That's correct. Praise That's the correct. Lord. Yeah. Okay. So this product, and I'm, I'm again, I'm, I'm going to step out on a limb and say it's very good. Uh, I know many ministries are, are selling the product and using them to, to, uh, to help their ministries out, so to speak, including Living Matter Ministries. Uh, the product does very well. Everyone that we've come in contact with who has tasted this product loves this product. And I'm not saying that just to say it. They all love it. It is very, very tasty. And I, being a former chocoholic, you know, was very grateful that uh, something came along that I could eat. Of course, temperately, right? Every man that's striving for the mastery is temperate in all things. We know that first Corinthians 9, 925. But the product does taste well. So what I'd like to do at this point, I'd like to take a little time, do an overview of all the products, and also have a little, maybe a little, cooking, brief cooking demonstration, and also take a look at some of the products that can be produced by utilizing the raw products of the care of that Brother Scott and his company provide. Amen? A amen. Let's go ahead and do that now. Okay. Praise the Lord. Welcome to the Australian Outback, where the best quality, best tasting new generation care powder is produced. On our 76 acre orchard, we produce the sweetest varieties that result in the sweetest pods on the planet. What is a carob pod and what does it produce? Carob pods are grown on evergreen trees. They hang from the trees and are harvested one time a year. The Australian carob is loaded with fiber, vitamins, minerals. It's a superfood. Two times the amount of calcium than chocolate and no caffeine and no stimulants and no theobromine. This product is fantastic. If you're progressing from chocolate to carob, and let me show you some of the different products that we have at, at the Outback in Australia. Our first product is our organic carob kibble. This is milled and kibbled from the pod minus the seeds. This is an excellent product for your trail mix or for a tea or just eating right out of the bag. Our next product is our raw carob powder. And you can see that the raw carob powder is lighter in color. The reason why it's light in color is because we don't use any heat when we mill the pods into the powder. This allows a lot of the enzymes and the beneficial benefits of carob itself not to be lost in this raw carob powder product. You still have some of the benefits in your roasted carob powder, which is darker in color. Um, and this can be used in your favorite chocolate recipes since you're trying to get away from chocolate into carob. And this can be used in muffins, pancakes, uh, it can make car uh, carob granola, um, and it can make the following products, which I'll explain in a few minutes here. Um, so this is a fantastic product for your chocolate recipes. Um, the next product is our carob uh, syrup, and this is made from our carob kibble. Water is added to this, 
it's heated, pressed and filtered back out into a thick carob syrup. This is similar to somewhere between a maple syrup and molasses. Excellent for your favorite dessert topping, oatmeals, put on your favorite ice cream, uh, yogurts. Um, glycemic index of 15 on all of these products. Um, so very good for diabetics or people who want low sugar uh, diets. Um, our next product are our Aussie Shark Bars. And these bars are made with our Australian roasted carob powder in a facility in Oregon. Um, these products, we have six flavors. We've got the almonds, we've got banana cream, we've got Outback Mint, unsweetened, unsweetened almonds, and original. Six flavors, these are creamy, smooth, and for people transitioning from chocolate to carob, this really bridges the gap and these are certified organic, vegan, gluten-free products. Our newest product to our portfolio are the carob chips. And these carob chips are our original shark bar recipe made into chips. And these can be used in a variety of ways, in a trail mix, can be used in muffins, it can be used um, any way you want, or just eaten right out of the bag. Um, and these are also certified organic, as well as all of our other products. So these are the products uh, on the Outback, on the range, and these are an excellent uh, product, again, to transition from chocolate to carob. Because that, as Adventists, we don't want to ingest theobromine or caffeine to block uh, any discernment or the Holy Spirit from working in us. So excellent products to transition from chocolate to carob. In addition to the health benefits of carob, there's a growing concern in countries like Africa, specifically Ghana and the Ivory Coast, where up to two million children have been used for profit by MMRs, Hershey, and other big corporations. These corporations make $103 billion a year. Isn't Carob a better option? With Australian Carob Company, it's a family-owned business. There's no children involved at all, and we've talked about the health benefits of Carob. This is a better choice, Carob over chocolate. Come to the Australian Carob Company and try our range of products. Welcome back to the Australian Carob Test Kitchen. My husband Scott has been sharing with you about our Carob product line, and my daughter Elise and I are here to help you learn some ways to incorporate Carob into your diet. Now, Carob is a natural substitute for chocolate, so basically any recipe you have that calls for chocolate chips or um, cocoa powder, you can substitute Carob for that or Carob chips and have a nice healthy option. Uh, for example, we have some carob cupcakes. This recipe is from the Young Disciples Camp Cookbook. But basically, if you have any um, cupcake recipe or cake recipe you like, you just substitute the carob powder for the cocoa powder. And these I really like. They turn out moist, but also a little crispy on top. The carob chips, they hold their shape very nicely. So basically, if you have a bowl and a whisk, you can make great homemade cupcakes. You just stir together your dry ingredients and then your wet ingredients, sprinkle a few carob chips on top, and pop them in the oven for about 20 minutes, and you have a nice, healthy option for dessert. Um, if you want to do a special occasion, you can also add a little frosting on top. One I like is a vegan cream cheese like a half tub of tofuti cream cheese mixed with a little uh, vegan butter, like Earth Balance. And you blend those together, add a little organic powdered sugar, and you can make somebody a fabulous birthday cake and a good, a good treat. Now for demoing two of our products, we'll show you how to use up some old bananas. I'm sure many of you have these hanging around your kitchen too. What we like to do with our family when we buy too many um, bananas is we peel them, pop them in Ziploc bags, and have them in the freezer so they're handy for smoothies. We're going to make a delicious carob banana shake. It will beat the pants off any chocolate shake recipe and give you the good healthy options. Take the lid off our blender here. First step is a couple cups of nut milk. This is almond milk, but you could use soy milk, oat milk, 
any vegan plant-based milk of your choice. So I'll pour that in the blender. And next, I'm going to use a blend of both the Australian roasted powder and the raw powder. You can certainly use one or the other. For whatever reason, our family just likes to use some of each. So I'm going to use a one-third cup. I'll fill it about two parts full of the roasted powder. And then I'm going to scoop in a little bit of the raw powder. It gives it a nice malty taste. And we'll add that in next on top of the milk. And this recipe is so easy, you could almost make it in your sleep, but please don't. Next ingredient, we're going to break into pieces two frozen bananas. And this is a great way to use up old, old bananas. So make it easy on the blender by breaking them up a little bit. All right, so now we have the two bananas in there. Uh, another option, which I won't um, do today, but if you like a little more uh, protein in your shake, you can take fresh ground almond butter or cashew butter, a couple heaping tablespoons, um, put right in the blender, and it gives a little extra pro protein for the shake. All right, now stay tuned while we blend the shake for about 20 seconds. All right, doesn't take long at all to get a nice creamy shake. And we'll pour it into some glasses for our studio audience to try here in a moment. This is a nice treat. We often serve this um, Sabbath evenings when we have a group over. And people want just a little something to, to sip on. And we'll go the extra mile and put a little of our pure carob syrup on top, just a little drizzle. It'll add a little extra sweetness to the shake. Feel free to do fancy designs. All right. Brother Bridges, your yes. shake is served. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're May I? welcome. Yes, please. To your help and God's glory. Mm. Very nice. How about a toast? To the eternal kingdom. Amen. Amen, sister. <laughs> Very nice, saints. Very nice. Amen. Welcome back to the Australian Carob Test Kitchen. I'm Elise Carney, and I'm going to be showing you how to make the carob granola. So the first step is to take four cups of quick oats. And then we'll set that to the side. We're going to do one cup of maple syrup. And then we're going to do half a cup of sunflower oil. Now we're going to do one tablespoon of vanilla extract without alcohol. I get my vanilla extract at Trader Joe's. And then
then half a tablespoon of salt. And then we're going to do one tablespoon of water. And then one fourth a cup of our roasted carob powder. And then you put it on the stove and heat it at a low temperature, stirring constantly. And you wait until it begins to boil and then you turn it off and you mix your wet ingredients with your oats. And then you spread it out on a baking pan and put it in an oven that's been preheated to 325 degrees Fahrenheit. And you let it cook for 15 minutes and then you take it out, stir it, put it in for another 10 minutes. And then take it out, stir it, put it in for 10 minutes again and then take it out and it will be soft, but as you let it sit out, it will harden. Brother Bridges, would you like to try some? My dear young sister, I would be honored. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for blessing us today. You're welcome. It's very good. The book Councils on Diet and Foods, Sister White brings out that our food should be tasty and palatable. Amen. 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 We are ready for our final dessert at the Australian Carob Test Kitchen. This one might surprise a few people, but we're going to share a recipe for avocado pudding. Brother Bridges seemed a little skeptical of this one, but um, I'm confident he will find it satisfying and creamy, even with this um, surprising ingredient. This recipe comes from the Simply Fresh cookbook and it has become a family favorite. The ingredients, and we'll just use it in a blender, our ingredients are two ripe avocados, a wonderful ingredient, lots of good healthy fat there. Our sweetener, you can use either maple syrup or today we're going to use pitted medjool dates. So you wanna make certain to take the pits out. That The recipe calls for five pitted dates. I just slightly chopped them. We'll mix those in with the avocado. And we're using the Australian Carob Company Sweet Aussie Chips. We've melted down four ounces of the chips in a double boiler. So the water is gently heated in the bottom of the pot. And then you stir until the chips are nice and liquid. And we will add that ingredient in. This will make it super decadent. And since you can't use too much carob, in our opinion, we will also put in three tablespoons of roasted carob powder. So we'll add a little extra sweetness as well as fiber and carob is a good source of calcium as well. All right, and there's our third tablespoon. Other simple ingredients, we have a pinch of sea salt. And I'm one for following recipes. A lot of people grab little smidgens, dashes, and pinches. I have the actual measuring cups for those exact amounts. And we'll use one teaspoon of vanilla to bring out the richness of all the flavors. And one final ingredient, a quarter cup of plant-based milk. We're using almond milk today. And those are our ingredients. We'll give it a nice mix in the blender for about a minute or until nice and creamy. And I'm going to use the wand since the avocados are fairly dense, but they'll be creamed up in no time. All right. Now what we have is 
is a dessert that doesn't look anything like avocado anymore. It's a nice, thick, chocolatey, but it's carob in this case, pudding. So if you don't tell anybody what's in it, they will have no idea. They'll think they're having a nice, decadent pudding. But this has the health benefits of the nutritious and creamy avocado. Let's see if Brother Bridges is brave enough to come try our dessert today. I am, my sister. I am. I'm so glad. All right. Let's see. Mmm. Very, very nice. Thank you. You don't taste the avocado, do you? Not at all. Very Just the nice. the nice texture of the creaminess, like a good pudding. Sister mm. Leslie, you, you converted me. I'm a Praise believer. Praise the Lord. I'm looking forward <laughs> to having it in the Living Manor Test Kitchen. Amen. Excellent. Maybe this is something you can make for your wife who's Amen. fond of avocados. Amen. Praise the Lord. Wonderful. This recipe, though it can be eaten right from the blender, it is yes. recommended that it be served chilled, so it is more like an authentic pudding. Okay. All right. Amen, Saints. You heard it right here. Mm -hmm. So when you first pulled up, the first time you came and visited, when you drove the six hours from western Washington, or about to say Tennessee, to here, and you first pulled up and saw this place, what part of this was here? What portion of the house was actually here? Right, the property is situated on 20 acres, majority okay, of it altogether. wooded, uh -huh. and we had 780 square feet. So from these planters, okay. straight up was the structure of the house at 780 square feet. Okay. We added on about 500 square feet to get us to 1,200 total square feet. Okay. Feet of so, the home. Okay. So all this was added on later. Yeah, all this was added on after we moved in okay. uh, the first year. Okay. Now right. you had a contractor come, but you also assisted. Did correct. you help out? Okay. And by doing that, you learned how to do some things practically on your own, correct? I did, yeah. You know, you learned framing, how to frame windows and doors and, yes. and do the roof structure um, and uh, different flooring. I didn't do any drywalling, but the main structure of the house I needed to know because I knew I needed to build okay. the wood house structure, which houses a lot of our tools and our wood supply. Yes, sir. Four, uh, yes, sir. Four cords of wood. Okay. Now the weather is changing. It's a little rainy here in, in eastern Tennessee, it's eastern Washington. I'm sorry, eastern Washington. So we're going to keep it moving. Let's move down to the garden area sure. over here and take a look at the fruit trees in the garden. So before we get over to the garden and the fruit trees, I notice you have a little pit here. What do you call it? It's called a. It's it's a it's a arbor structure with a fire okay. pit. Okay. Okay. Fire pit. That's what I meant to say. Yeah. And you guys actually built this, or you built this? Yes, we did. I built okay. this. Okay. All right. Now, what do you guys do here as a family? Usually two or three or four times during the spring, summer months, we'll have Adventist friends and not Adventist over. Okay. And we'll do a light meal here and just talk about a lot of the world's issues and, and yes, Seventh-day Adventism and, and some of the issues uh, that are uh, we're dealing with uh, okay. towards the end of time here. So okay. it's very nice. It's sunken in about two feet, although there's a, there's a lot of ash in there. But when this thing gets going, it provides nice heat mm. uh, when the nights get a little cool here. Yes, sir. So this is, um, a lot of people really enjoy these every year when we, when we okay. do these. Okay, praise God. Nice, nice yeah. little fellowship area. Excellent fellowship area. You could area. probably use a little bit of that heat right now. We could use a little bit of heat. <laughs> amen, amen. Right. Okay, so the garden is? So six years ago, we, we leveled out this area, mm -hmm. and I wanted to have between 13 and 16 fruit trees. Okay. Um, so, you know, to spread out the fruit trees, we had about the room for about 16 fruit trees. So we've got, we've got two Bartlett pears. We've got a Rainier cherry. Okay. Um, we've got a two Van cherries, and then we've got very nice Macintosh and uh, Honey Crisp apples, and then two Golden Delicious apples. We've recently okay. planted uh, an, another apple tree here, and two almond trees. Wow. So that you get a source of protein in the diet. So we hadn't had those before. Um, so these are younger trees, but okay. we planted them the Ellen White method, of course. Praise God. And uh, Which is three feet by three feet by three feet deep, correct? Right, okay. right. And then you're amending and the soils at different levels all yes. the way to the top. Yes, sir. Um, now, I have to tell you, brother, my favorite apple in the world is the Honey Crisp. Is the Honey Crisp. May I have the honor of going to pick one? We've got one available for you. Praise the Lord, brother. Right here. And so we do kale. We do strawberries as well. And then we have what we call kind of our carrot area okay. where it's just, these are what Leslie calls volunteer carrots. They just grow and they, they've mm, seeded. Okay. And uh, everybody's amazed at how we can grow carrots, but they're all 
classified as volunteers. Yeah, volunteer, yeah. Um, I know that term. And we, we like it, appreciate it. And we've got a couple of blueberry plants in here and then a blackberry on the back okay. wall here. So, Amen. Amen. Um, so this provides, uh, you know, food for not only us for self-sustainability, but for sure. anybody as we move towards the end of time so that we can feed these people and show them how to eat right. Amen, brother. Um, That's and right. then, of course, if there's a no buy, no sell situation, we can all course change with friends and neighbors yes you know blueberries for strawberries or apples for amen you know, amen that's right some bartering so but in addition to that in addition to the care of business ministry you have which is bringing in an income stream you also have an opportunity here with a garden to also sell some vegetation and fruit to provide another a secondary income stream source and there are many other ways to make money when you're in the country as well right you know with the madison school um, you're talking about education for part of the day, and then the yes. other part, you're actually doing the physical labor. That's right. Um, and that's what we're doing, you know, as a homeschooling, you know, with our daughter, Elise. Yes, sir. We try to do both of that here in a smaller unit or micro setting. Amen, brother. So. Well, let's continue to the. Uh, yeah, let's. The honey crisp tree. So here's the honey crisp. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Are, it's a pretty large one. Yeah, that. You can take that. I'll go with that, that one. guy right Very there. Very nice. You want. This, this could be breakfast in the morning tomorrow. Yeah. Amen. I appreciate that, brother. It's got a wormhole. It's, or, it's organic. I guess if you have wormholes, it's yes. Uh, it's health benefit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Appreciate it. Okay, let's move up to see some of these other structures that you built. Sure. Before we head on in. Amen. So you added this on after you built on the add-on to the house. And this is a... This is what we call the wood house. Okay. So it stores a lot of the tools and... Um, Basically, all of our cords of wood in here, so we okay. can get about six to eight cords of wood in this size okay. wood house. Okay, and this is so. for your wood burning stove, correct? It's for our Amish wood burning stove that okay. uh, yeah provides heat for the house. Also, it thermal siphons up to heat our hot water tank, of course, too. Amen. So, Amen. That's wonderful. So it's not a huge structure, but it's big enough, and um, like I said, you can get eight to ten cords of wood in here. Amen. Uh, which we go through about four cords of wood per winter here. Okay. And the fact that you built it yourself, when you left Western Tennessee outside of Seattle and came here, did you know how to do this type of work? Uh, I had a little bit of experience building, building decks and different okay. things, so I had a little, little knowledge experience. ahead of it. But as far as the roof structure, uh -huh. um, that was new, okay. new information. So Amen. A practical knowledge. That was a little bit knowledge. of a challenge. And you can see a slight bend in the front here. Um, the other side looks very nice. I should have okay. started on that side. That's okay, uh, but brother. But got a little bit of a bend here, but I'm an okay. amateur builder. And, oh, but it looks wonderful, brother. The average eye. it turned eye, out pretty good, so. The non-discerning eye would never see that. It's getting the job done, amen? Right, amen. Praise the Lord, brother. Amen. Let's go look at your, uh, your greenhouse sure. now. Sure. After you, brother. <clears throat> sure. Okay, so this is a greenhouse, and you built this also. Yeah, initially this was our horse stable. Okay. So we had hay from this point all the way back. All right. Um, but then as we <clears throat> brought in the two horses and just the, the overall commitment to horses became a little bit overbearing and I had allergies to the hay and different things. Okay. And these, these animals um, require a lot of, a lot of care. A lot so of we attention. converted this into a greenhouse for the ability to extend our season uh, yes, one sir. month on each end, in yes, the fall sir. and in the spring. Okay. So this top structure was all composition roof. We got some polycarbonate from uh, Home Depot. Okay. I cut this out and then we put that down and it screwed down into the uh, support beams here. And then uh, layered over so we don't get any leaks. And uh -huh. then of course I've wrapped this, reinforced yeah. it and built the windows for ventilation Amen. in the unit. Amen. I love the kind of a wrap around uh, raised beds you have here. I kind of like that. Very creative. Sure, it makes it easy. You don't have to bend over too far and yeah, it's not a lot of bed space, but um, we'll do some uh, uh, Like the peas we're trying to get to grow up. Uh-huh and um, You're gonna get so a trellis have more, or something? more room. Yeah, we'll have a trellis. We'll have more room Amen. to grow in here. Yes, sir so. And of course the benefit of having a raised bed is that you have I'm sorry the benefit of having a greenhouse is that you can control the weather in here and you can literally grow year-round so it doesn't limit yeah. you as far as weather is concerned. And we might have a little bit of a challenge th with that because it does get pretty cold here and we have a lot of days yes. with no sun. Yes, sir. So unless I had a wood stove in here, I might right. not be able to heat through December, All January, through. February. I understand. So there may be three months that we, where we can't I understand. generate food in this building. I understand. It's very nice, brother. God, God is good. 
Let's go take a quick look at your wood burning stove before we wrap up. Sure. Can we? Sounds good. Okay. So this is your Amish wood burning stove. This is the Flame View, yeah, Flame built by View. the Amish in uh, Ohio. Okay. And then uh, we purchased it from Stoves and More in Adventist Brother in okay. West Virginia. Now, notice this one has some white uh, paneling. I've never noticed. I've seen one that's been white before. That's kind of unique, isn't it? Uh, it is. I wanted just the, the solid black color, but Leslie, uh, with her interior decorating skills, wanted a lighter color. Yes, brother. Which it turned out great, but it's got a thermostat on here. It's got an oven, um, and we've, we reheat things. She's cooked uh, squash in here and, okay. and different things, and then there's a warming drawer below. And then there's a warm drawer above. Um, so when people are thinking about buying a wood stove, uh, they want to make sure that the flue or the, or the pipe that goes up to the house isn't too long mm -hmm. or curvy. You can get creosote buildup in there. That's right. And this one's very nice because it, while it does have a bit of a break, we burn pretty hot and then we're only six feet to the roof. Okay. So it burns hot, keeps the stove clean. And this particular unit has the window on the side, which we like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can actually see the fire yes. as well. And, yes. And the other thing is, you know, we bought a smaller home. And we don't have to um, use a lot of wood. I mentioned we use about four cords of wood a year, but it yeah. gets very, very cold here. And we shut the loft area. So our living space is about 800 square feet here. Okay. Uh huh. So this thing, it takes about an hour to two hours to really heat up mm -hmm. when we've been gone all day, but we quickly get to 75 degrees, which is very comfortable in the wintertime. So, Amen. So this Amen. is a, a, a great unit for us to have out here in the country where we live. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, brothers and sisters, I pray that you enjoyed and were blessed by our presentation today. Uh, we have spent the majority of this day here in, in uh, eastern Washington with the Scott Carney family, his, his wife, dear wife, Leslie, and their dear daughter, sister, Elise. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to contact them regarding the Carob and the Carob products, uh, if you imp feel impressed to uh, get on board with supporting their ministry here, uh, please feel free to contact them at all the information that's on your screen right now. We pray again that you've been blessed, and we like to close at this time with a brief word of a prayer, may we? Okay. Sure. Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us through this very day. We thank you for being with us today, Lord, as we discuss these important, important issues regarding what we believe is salvation. We know, Lord, you want your people to be in a certain place, and you have a specific evangelistic system set up, which you call the Country Outpost Center, where we can have components in it that will lead people to Jesus, that we can have an established stronghold, as it were, out of the country, away from the city where we can go into the cities, work the cities, reach people, bring them back to our outpost setting out in the country, teach them about health, heal them, show them how to stay well and, and heal all the other people as well. But most importantly, Lord, that they will be led to Jesus and give their lives to Him. Father, time is running out and we need to get more serious about what we're doing. Please, dear Lord, have mercy on us. Give us a zeal for your work. Give us a passion for souls. And help us, Lord, when it's all said and done, to be overcomers and victorious over sin. We love and thank you. And we ask it all in dear Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for watching another Ark to Build, the Country Outpost Center on Living Mana Media. So to send a gift of love to Living Mana Ministries, go to our website and simply click the Donate tab. Thank you for your support. And God bless.